Coming up on Tech News today, we're going to take a close look at kind of next-gen municipal Wi-Fi, what it's like to live like a cow in virtual reality. Yes, it's strange, but it's very cool. Apple's new app for musicians, Microsoft donates a chunk of its cloud to nonprofits and so much more. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1432, recorded Wednesday, January 20th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Credit Karma. This year, you may not make it to the gym every day, but you can work out your credit score with Credit Karma. Get your free credit report at creditkarma.com and see why over 45 million people have joined. That's creditkarma.com. And by PillPack, a full-service pharmacy that combines convenient packaging, modern technology, and personalized service to make your life easier. Visit PillPack.com slash twit to save $20 on vitamins and OTCs when you transfer your prescriptions. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about the tech news with people who are passionate about the tech news. In a little bit, we're going to talk to Devendra Hardawar. I am Megan Maroney. And I am Jason Howell. Yes, Devendra Hardawar is going to join us a little bit later in the show to talk a little bit about filmy stuff, a little bit about fast Wi-Fi. Uh, in New York City, mm -hmm. some really interesting stuff he's got going over at Engadget. We'll also talk about Cal VR. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should explain that anymore, but just say Cal <laughs> We'll just drop VR. that mic in the, in the middle of the room and walk away. Mm -hmm. There you go, Cal VR coming should up. Should we get to the news? Let's do it. Today, Apple announced the new Music Memos app, a tool for musicians and songwriters to capture their ideas wherever inspiration strikes. Apparently, a lot of iPhone-wielding musicians were using the Voice Memos app to record snippets of their song creations. According to Jim Dalrymple of the Loop Insight, Apple has expanded what Voice Memos can do and turned this feature into a brand new free app for iOS called Music Memos. You can record a snippet and set it to automatically save to all of your devices via iCloud. I am not a musician. Maybe you mm. should be. Maybe I know. you can be now that it's possible to make music like ridiculously easy with your iPhone. That's what I thought about the Apple Pencil. Like, just give me the <laughs> Apple Pencil and I'll He'll be turn Picasso. You into an artist. But um, <laughs> yeah, maybe this will turn me into Adele. I so don't I, know. I can't unlock it because oh, it's yeah. it's got your That's fingerprints. Right. But um, uh, That's by design. Yes, exactly. You have that security, so I can't get into your phone. Uh, <laughs> essentially, this is the music memo app. So there's a couple of announcements, but basically, this is the one that I actually played around with. Now, I'm an I'm an Android guy. Mm -hmm. I haven't had a whole lot of experience with iOS, but Megan did let me uh, paw around on her on her device for about 10 minutes with this music memo app. And it's actually really cool. I got to say, as a musician, I really like what you can do. And I'll just kind of show you what I was able to do really quickly. It pretty much, I just, I just hit record and did this random like beatboxing thing. And then we'll go ahead and play it here. Can you hear it? All right. Kind of cheesy. No, it's our new opening theme song, I think. <laughs> I'll go ahead and take the bass out, take the drums. So I didn't program any of the drums or any of the bass, right? That's all done dynamically by Apple. All I did is record that, that voice memo. And then, you know, it has tools so that I could trim it up and everything. Essentially what they're doing with this app, and it's, you know, it's a cool tool for musicians because... What it allows me to do is record an idea that I might have wherever I happen to be, obviously with my voice in this case, but if you had a guitar, you could record it with a guitar uh, or whatever instrument you have. And it's analyzing that waveform and then it's kind of timing it uh, to whatever tempo it happens to be. And there's some you know, tempo controls that you can go into um, to, to kind of you know, play around with it and everything. You can also change like the complexity of the drums. So if we're, let's see here, let's go ahead, turn them on. You can make it louder. So catchy. I know, I know. You can make it a little bit quieter. You can kind of play around with the, the dynamics of it. But ultimately, it's basically meant to just kind of be a scratch pad for musicians to very quickly um, have a little bit of that kind of technical, you know, knowledge underneath mm -hmm. to just like throw an accompaniment on it. Uh, it shows, ba you know, a bass guitar line that actually matches a lot of the notes that I was singing and it, it perfectly timed the drums to it. An interesting approach. What I wonder is why, 
why now from Apple? Like, this is a really cool tool. And I personally, as, you know, I would love to have a tool like this on my phone. I've thought about these kinds of tools before. Um, but it just seems so random and out of, out of nowhere to be like, hey, we created this music scratch pad app. We're Apple. Yay. I think Apple really has always been supporting musicians. And, yeah. you know, music has always been a big part of what Apple does. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that they, they saw that people were using the memos app, the voice memos app, and they thought, oh, well, what more could we do? Um, you're supposed to be able to easily share this to social media or to GarageBand. Um, we had a little bit of a hard time with that. I don't know if it was just me, but I tried to put it on Dropbox. Uh, we tried to email it. It didn't, it just kind of, you know, it, it's not perfect yet. That's all I can say. But um, yeah, you can put it into GarageBand for iOS, which also got an update. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris Velasco at Engadget says it makes recording so easy. You might not even need talent anymore. I don't know. GarageBand has always been, you know, that's kind of been its calling card, right? It's yeah. been a, 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 a DAW, digital audio workstation for people who are just kind of starting to kind of get their feet wet in making music. And mm -hmm. that's awesome. I love the democratization of these tools for people who aren't necessarily experienced creatives, mm -hmm. but they're giving, they're, they're making a lot of these tools so simple that anybody can kind of get in there. Like, you know, there, there was a time 20 years ago where you had to have musical talent, let's say, to even come up with something that's halfway listenable. And for better or for worse, some people would probably argue on either side of this, but for better or for worse, now even if you have no background, no knowledge of making music, uh, companies like Apple are making tools that make it so that you can still sit down and create something that you can play for somebody else and not feel kind of ashamed of, you know what I mean? <laughs> for lack of ability. Like you can do something and it's relatively easy. And Apple's very good at that with, with GarageBand. Yeah, I was really impressed how you just picked up my phone and you just, you know. I know, you were started. like, can you make sense of this? And in like two minutes, I had this beat going and the boom, ba doo, -ch, yeah. boom, ba doo, ba doo. I was actually really impressed with how easy it was. It was yeah. a lot of fun. It's worth checking out. Yeah. Uh, let's say, oh, yo, that was oh, you. Bloomberg Business reports that the good people at Microsoft will donate one billion dollars worth of their Azure cloud services to select nonprofits over the next three years. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella announced the donation at the Davos World Economic Forum today as part of the revamped Microsoft Philanthropies division. Uh, this is really interesting. It's, it's part of it is new, but they've been giving, they give away office. They, right. you know, they, they give away their software, but this is you know, I, I thought about this a lot today. So my first instinct was like, well, of course, because they want more people to, you know, they have to compete with Amazon. They want more people to, to use their services and their nonprofits and then maybe think that that will, you know, give them more business, more of the market share. But it's still great. I mean, nonprofits need cloud services just like the rest of us. Yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to find fault when a company as powerful and as big as Microsoft or Google or whatever, you know, Google has their own kind of nonprofit education efforts um, you know, and just kind of bringing the software, like when you think about Google's office suite, you know, it's completely free for, <laughs> for most people. And the fact that you can access that Microsoft's kind of getting into that game too. And so you can play one side, which is like, well, this is just going to bolster their numbers and get more people exposed to it. But is that a bad thing? I mean, this is really, you know, powerful, valuable stuff for a lot of people who might not have had access to it, uh, before. So Right. They, really there's good. select nonprofits. They haven't really said what the selection process is going to be. Uh, but yeah, I think it's good. You know, we're, we're all, we all have our self-interests at heart, I think. So Microsoft is no different. You know, uh, it's also about, you know, the digital divide and just kind of closing that gap. And for that, uh, big props to Microsoft. Uh, speaking of Microsoft, heads up if you purchased a Surface Pro, uh, Surface Pro 2 or Surface Pro 3 before March, of 2015, Microsoft's getting ready to voluntarily recall the power cords that shipped with those units and trade them out with replacements for free is due to potential overheating issues. This is according to a Microsoft spokesperson in contact with ZDNet and Twit's Mary Jo Foley. Um, basically, it, it kind of stems from the cords being wound too tightly. You know, wound or, or crimped, kind of pinched over long periods That's of time. That's what times. happens to me, too, when I'm wound yeah. too tightly. <laughs> right. We're going to have to send you back, Megan, <laughs> uh, replace you with a new one. No, we, aren't, we won't do that. Uh, <laughs> official announcement, uh, like I said, expected uh, this Friday, January 22nd. There's going to have uh, an official site that people can kind of go to and, and you know, give you in, in information as far as how to discard of your, your dangerous old power cable. Um, but there were, there were some forum kind of complaints that have kind of propped up that are probably at the the root of this that were 
you know, complaining about like smoke, sparks, that kind of stuff. So not good. Good that Microsoft's planning on getting out in front of it. First hoverboards, now Surface 2s. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, but you think about Surface and Surface has been a big, uh, big success for Microsoft. So this is probably a large number when you're talking about that whole swath of, uh, of, of models, yeah. you know, uh, sold before that date. So anyways. Well, your Chrome browser could be faster soon. Google Web Performance Engineer Ilya Grigoric announced today that the new Broadly compression engine that was first introduced last year is coming soon. Broadly has entered the intent to ship status and promises to make Chrome 20 to 26 percent more efficient. This is exciting. It could reduce. It's best on mobile. That's where you get the most benefit. Even, you know, will save your battery life. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's, yes, that's obviously Google is trying to deliver you the internet as quickly as possible, as few snags as possible. Broadly is not the only, you know, their only effort in this regard. It wasn't, I think it was a couple of months back that I, that I, I was reminded that there is a um, kind of like a bandwidth or not a bandwidth, but a data uh, conservation mode inside the Chrome browser, at least on Android. I don't know about uh, for iOS, but I know it's in there for Android. And you can activate that if you know that it's in there. And over and basically what that does is server side, you know, they they choose to not send you images, things to cut down your data and just deliver you the information that you need, um, kind of cutting down your bandwidth and everything. Good for you know, good for uh, emerging markets as mm -hmm. well, where data where data plans are not nearly as plentiful as they are here. So this is all good work. I will admit, I was like reading it into the Bratley compression. You know, like a lot of a lot of different things that were posted about it, and the tech, the technology behind it, the specifics of it, flew a little bit over my head. But I really appreciate that they are doing this because faster internet is good. Yes, faster internet, good. <laughs> There we go. That's, that's, my, that's, my, that's my amazing comment. Fast internet, good. <laughs> uh, Brendan Ike, co-founder of Mozilla and creator of JavaScript, has a new startup called Brave Software. We've been hearing about this for a little while. Today marked the test release of the company's browser, Brave. And it's all about, again, uh, speeding up the delivery of websites. Not only that, it's a revolt against the current web ad model, which is kind of interesting. So it's ba I, I tried to get a copy, but I, I didn't get my invite necessarily at this point. So I'm, I'm looking forward to checking it out when it is uh, rolling out a little bit further, but you can sign up for that right now. Windows, OS 10, iOS, Android, all going to be supported. It's actually based on the Chromium uh, open source uh, license. So interesting that, you know, his background is Mozilla and it's not based on uh, Firefox. Uh, but there you go. So it's a bit. It's about ad blocking, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. So iOS nine opened the door to this idea of ad blocking, and it's been. You know, we've been going out back and forth. You know, people have amazing apps. They pull them because they don't want to be the one responsible for saying like what you know what's a good ad, what's a bad ad. Uh, you know, our our model is advertising based, but not the same way. Right. Um, but I but there's so many websites that I go to every day that I love that are supported fully by advertising. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like ads. And so what are they doing here? That's what's he, what's his plan to do this differently? The plan is very interesting. So the claim is that they're going to be able to block all third party tracking cookies, uh, fingerprinting techniques, you know, that can I kind of identify you, uh, ad injection scripts, all that kind of stuff. And Brave eventually wants to replace the site ads if you choose. So you have the ability to say, you know, as you can do with ad blockers, you have the ability to say, no, I want to I want this site to get, you know, my ad revenue, you know, money for me, you know, seeing the ads. So mm -hmm. you can turn that on a site by site basis. I think there's a selection. Stay uh, ad uh, supported yes, on this stay site. Stay ad supported on this site. So you know exactly what you're doing. Um, but they want to replace eventually the site ads with its own ads, uh, <laughs> which I find rather interesting to kind of help pay for the service. Brave will actually monitor your browsing history without knowing who you are, mm -hmm. they say. <laughs> uh, and they're passing those categories to publishers to be able to place, you know, appropriate ads for you. So, I don't know, maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but it feels like replacing one with another. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's like an ad blocker, but eventually they plan on also showing you ads to kind of help uh, pay for the service. Well, it's interesting that it comes from the co-founder of Mozilla because that's, you know, that's a name we trust already. So, I don't know. I'm excited to try it out. Uh, and then we can speak 
whether speak to whether yeah. we support it. So. Hopefully we can get that soon. Mm -hmm. Well, a flaw in the Linux kernel dating back to 2012 could put tens of millions of PC servers and Android phones at risk. This is according to security researchers at Perception Point. The zero-day local privilege escalation vulnerability could allow malicious hackers to gain root access to devices. I will not pretend to understand how this hack works, but I know it is bad. And I know that nobody has seen it in the wild yet, which is so much of what we hear now. It's like oh, security it. research say, say this, right. and you have to trust that a bad thing could have happened and now it's been fixed. Yeah. And you know, a lot of times at the root cause of this, it's it's uh, bad practices on the user would, would result in some sort of potential, you know, security vulnerability. It's a lot of a lot of FUD around uh, kind of Android security. You know, like you say, a lot of researchers find these holes and they exist, yes, but they're not being exploited. Uh, Google has done a lot um, on the server side to kind of mitigate you know, issues like this. And now, now that we're getting, at least on Android, we're getting a monthly security update. Even things that may have potentially gotten through uh, tend to get patched pretty darn fast. So yeah, Google's prepared yeah. a patch. They mm -hmm. told Wired that the tens of millions number uh, that everyone is quoting is inaccurate. That's what Google says. And Red Hat and Ubuntu have both also released updates already. Well, there's, there's, a ton of Android devices. So the number is always going to be high, you know, when there's any sort of potential risk. Um, but I guess that's not to, to lessen, you know, the fact that, you know, security issues are no joke, but many times it ends up not being as big a deal as, as maybe a lot of the outlets say that it is. Mm -hmm. So uh, up next, we're going to talk with Devinder Hardwar a little bit about some of his views on 4k Blu-ray and uh, just amazing Wi-Fi speeds, uh, commu uh, municipal Wi-Fi in New York. And we have an interview with Kara Platoni, who experienced CalVR and lived to write a book about it. But first, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of this episode. That is Credit Karma. I'm guessing you made your New Year's resolutions. Maybe learn a new word every day or play music every morning, maybe with that app by Apple. Uh, that's one of mine anyways, playing music through speakers, not necessarily writing music every morning, although I should do that. Uh, maybe you've decided to hit the gym every day, every single day. That's a tough one. Well, you may not make it to the gym every day. It's easy to take the necessary steps to get your finances in fighting shape. And what exactly does that entail? Well, you got to be informed of where you stand. Uh, it all begins with checking your credit score. Most people don't know their credit score, and really it's no surprise. So many of the websites that offer credit reports are confusing, come with hidden fees, well, Credit Karma does things differently. They offer truly free credit reports with no strings attached. And the best part about it, you don't have to give them your credit card to get started. Credit Karma doesn't just show you a score and then send you out the door. They actually break it down so you can see how your actions can affect your score. For situations like when you use too much of your credit limit, for example, and your score goes down as a result of that. It's a good way to monitor that and know kind of how to act differently. To make their services even easier to access, they also have free mobile apps for iOS and Android devices. And it's no wonder 45 million members turn to Credit Karma to check their credit score. I signed up, took me no time at all. Soon after, I was staring at my own credit report. And thankfully, thankfully, it all checks out. No surprises, just the way I like and the beautiful part about that, of course, is that this is a tool that can give you that peace of mind. So here's what you can do to check it out for yourself. Visit creditkarma.com right now to get your free report. You may not get to those crunches and you might fall behind on your word of the day thing, but you can feel more confident about your finances this year. Get your free credit report today by visiting creditkarma.com right now. And we thank Credit Karma for their support. All right, so we are thrilled to welcome to the show Devendra Hardwar. I'm a huge fan uh, from Engadget, and it's just great to have you on today. How are you doing today, Devendra? Hey, guys. Glad to be here. I'm doing well. Just uh, it's getting late in the East Coast, so it's like I'm kind of fading a little. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> no. Not yet. 
Not yet. We've got some things that we want to ask you about. Specifically, one, right. of, one of the things that you've been working on is a very interesting story. Uh, you have an article on Engadget about Link NYC, which is New York City's free gigabit Wi-Fi. It's actually replacing the many phone, like uh, mm -hmm. pay phones uh, throughout the city. You also spoke with the folks behind Link NYC at CES a few weeks back. Tell us a little bit about your direct experience using this and why it's such a departure for municipal Wi-Fi. Yeah, um, so they kicked it off in public beta testing uh, yesterday morning. So I just kind of ran over there uh, to test it out. And uh, yeah, I was getting speeds of around uh, 300 megabits up and down, uh, pretty close to that. And that is, that's insane. That's just crazy, right? That is, I have, uh, I'm paying for a 100 megabit service here at home so I can talk to you guys with like good streams and everything. And even then I'm seeing like maybe 60 to 70 at best. And wow. uh, that's, uh, you know, 300 megabits, that's what, 10 times the national average for broadband. That's just insane. And what's really cool is that this is a free service uh, provided. Um, it, it's, it's a union by the city and a group called City Bridge New York, which is made up of a couple of different companies, including Qualcomm. Uh, and it, it was just uh, New York City a couple of years ago had this idea. They wanted to shut down all the pay phones and get rid of them. And they had this idea to modernize it. And this ended up being the project that kind of came forward. And it's amazing to me that this project, uh, you know, they had the idea, they implemented it, they started deploying things in about a year which is crazy for any like city project. No and uh, I've seen a lot of municipal Wi-Fi and normally it's like the stuff you get in coffee shops, right? It's very slow. It's really hard to connect to. Uh, this is gigabit Wi-Fi. They're running fiber to every, not every single payphone, but most of the payphones um, are getting direct fiber connections. That means, you know, you're sharing crazy fast speed. You're sharing a gigabit connection with a ton of people. Uh, but even then, um, you should still be seeing really fast speed. So it's just, it's kind of amazing what they're trying to do. And they're paying for all of this with advertising kind of on the units themselves. Uh, they're two 55-inch uh, uh, screens on two sides of the unit. And they'll display like, uh, you know, all sorts of ads. And they could be moving ads. It could just be still posters. Um, the whole city is going to be littered with these things. So, and kind of, it's going to add to some of the urban noise and, and light pollution that we're seeing around. But at the same time, it could be really useful too because they could put public service announcements on those screens. Um, people could also do all sorts of other things with these links. You could charge your phone. They have USB ports. You just you know, plug it in. Um, they're going to have tablets that you can use for free phone calls uh, using Vonage <laughs> wow. and uh, also for finding directions and things happening in the city. Like it's just a really... Uh, useful infrastructure thing, you know, just a great way to communicate with the local community and, you know, offering something that everybody needs more than they need, you know, a payphone. So what about security or privacy concerns? Mm -hmm. Is there, are you worried about people, uh, are the city or anyone tracking you by using this? Well, they say, um, I was reading some earlier comments from them and it sounded like they may be tracking certain things, uh, but the representatives got in touch with me today and said they're not tracking any traffic. The only thing they get is your uh, your MAC address because you, you're connecting to their network. Um, there's a very long privacy policy um, that CityBridge point, uh, put out and uh, it seems pretty, uh, it seems normal. Like it seems totally fine. Uh, we just kind of have to trust that they and the New York City uh, Department of Information Technology are going to kind of abide by that. I think the most, uh, the only thing that I saw that could be kind of weird is that the, they may be selling some anonymized data based on how people are using the network, but nothing identifiable. And that's the sort of thing, um, you know, a lot of public networks do, and it, it happens a lot. It happens with advertising as well, free services online. Um, Security-wise, they also offer like a second network on every link uh, that's a private network. And if you're running a hotspot 2.0 device right now, they're supporting uh, iOS devices and I think some Macs. Uh, when you connect to the Link NYC network, it'll have you get this key and the key will automatically connect you to the private network, which is fully encrypted end to end. And yeah, they can't see anything there. The security uh, kind of fear that, that comes to mind for me is actually revolves around the charging ports because I know, oh yeah, you know, because yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of possibly fear, uncertainty and doubt around using public charging ports, like let's say at the airport or whatever, that people smarter than me know how to make it so that when you plug your phone in to charge there, it can actually mm -hmm. 
you know, do nasty things to your phone, get in there, install malware, something along those lines. Any fears of that happening when you've got these plastered all over the streets of New York City? That's definitely a fear. Like, I, I, that's yeah. actually a good point. I haven't talked to them about that, but I should bring up that point because uh, I do feel like, uh, yeah, when you normally see public charging points at like maybe uh, airports and especially conventions and things like that, they're not usually the wisest things to connect to because you don't know who's behind it. You don't mm -hmm. know what kind of hardware is behind it. Uh, this one, like the hardware looks pretty um, sturdy. Like, I don't think somebody's going to be able to like jack in there and plug in their own circuit board and their, you know, sure. kind of hijack the USB connection. Uh, but I don't know. I have to talk to them to see what they're doing to kind of check on that stuff. And still, that's very mm -hmm. cool. It must be awesome living in the future like that. <laughs> it's uh, the future. <laughs> now, shifting gears to film, of course, you mm -hmm. have a rich, um, let's say, let's say passion for film. You do. I like the movies. Yes. <laughs> yes. You, you like yourself the movies. We'll talk a little bit about this. First of all, you wrote up a piece that fully admits the awesomeness and the splendor that is the potential of 4K Blu-ray, while also admitting that consumers likely won't actually care so much about it. Why is that? Well, it's it's kind of a tough thing. Like I, yeah, as a cinephile, as a tech geek, I love the idea of 4K Blu-ray because uh, that's everything we've wanted, right? It is. That's a lot of resolution. That is yeah. what eight million pixels. Uh, it is four times resolution of traditional 1080p Blu-rays. Um, you, when you go to the theater, a lot of times they're actually being projected uh, with 4K projectors. So it's actually very, pretty much very close to the theatrical experience. It's going to be a great um, format, but the thing is, like, we're already seeing declines in Blu-ray sales, um, and we're seeing a huge increase in streaming uh, viewing uh, in terms of rentals and also watching things on, like, Netflix and Amazon Prime. And, uh, you know, that change is pushing people away from disc-based media. We're already seeing that with Blu-ray. Um, right now, for 4K Blu-ray, you know, you're going to have to buy a much more expensive player. Samsung's thing is 400 bucks, and the discs are going to be more expensive, too. Uh, right now, they're price between 30 and 40 bucks, depending on which movie, uh, that's, it's, it's just kind of a tough sell. And it seems like something that is, uh, I don't know, a kind of an anachronism in our media landscape today. Everybody just wants to like binge on Netflix, uh, you know, or rent something on iTunes or Vudu. That's just easier. Convenience we found in uh, home media formats just tends to win, right? That's kind of what helped VHS win over Betamax mm -hmm. and uh, Laserdisc and uh, MP3s, you know, and portable audio over the compact disc. Like that uh, convenience was the big draw there. So the Apple TV, the fourth generation Apple TV, notoriously mm -hmm. did not support 4K. Uh, and, and that was, do you think that that was a mistake or were they saying what you're saying that people don't really mm -hmm. care? Or do you think in the future, Apple TVs, they'll they'll say, yeah, maybe we made a mistake and we will support it. Yeah, I've, I haven't been a big proponent of 4K in general for the past few years because, yeah, the content wasn't there. And uh, a lot of the TVs aren't very future proof. Um, the TVs we're seeing this year and some of the later ones from last year support newer technologies like HDR, which I think are going to make a bigger impact in terms of how people see the, the future programming that makes things just look brighter, have deeper blacks and a wider range of colors. Uh, those sorts of things are going to make a bigger difference, I think. Um, it was probably a good decision for Apple not to include uh, 4K on the Apple TV because they don't have 4K ready in iTunes yet. You know, you have to have the whole the whole network set up to support that. And uh, yeah, even though people were buying 4K TVs, uh, there are many other ways for them to get 4K content too. Like if you have a modern TV, you probably have apps on your TV that support Netflix and Amazon already. Uh, Apple, with that Apple TV, was just kind of selling their interface. You can be sure this year's Apple TV, the one at the end of the year, uh, will be 4K compatible and it'll it'll like come with a whole new 4K set of things from iTunes. And hopefully 4K Star Wars The Force Awakens. Uh, <laughs> that would be glorious, yeah. We can, we can just go ahead and admit it's kind of a big deal, The Force Awakens. Uh, now yeah. it <laughs> sounds like Episode Eight, the next sequel, will see a delay from its originally scheduled date of May 26th, 2017. When are people going to get a chance to see this next release? Uh, actually, I didn't pull up the date on me. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Was it December twenty seventeen? Is what you said. December fifteenth, yes. twenty seventeen. I'm counting down the yes. days. I've got a timer on my Apple. You've already got a timer on your Apple Watch. Okay. <laughs> that is, and that's kind of interesting too, because that is, um, it's the same day Ready Player One comes out, which is Spielberg's movie based on that you know really geek friendly book. It's like ten days before Avatar two. Uh, and that's, it's going to be super geeky holiday season. So yeah, it's a shame that we're getting a delay, but uh, I'm still looking forward to it. Like I love Ryan Johnson, the guy who's uh, directing and writing this one. Uh, he did brick, he did looper back in the day, um, or a couple of years ago. So yeah, he's really talented and I want to see how he builds on the force awakens story.
Do you have opinions on this whole uh, Ray gate with toys that uh, <laughs> none of the toys have Ray? Oh, yeah. They really, they, and it's I guess. It's really sad. It yeah. Really and they, they yeah. thought Darth Vader was going to, or not, not Darth Vader, Kylo Ren was going to Kylo be the, Ren. the ba yeah. and, baby Vader. Yeah. yeah that, baby Vader. Right. <laughs> they thought he was going to be, you know, the most popular toy. And I'm a big fan of Adam He's Driver, the actor, yeah. but mm -hmm. um, they just thought everyone would want the evil and not the super wonderful, like, the she's awesome a girl, but she's gender girl. neutral. Yeah. And yeah. what were they thinking? I don't know. It's it's weird too because we're seeing it with uh, Black Widow uh, on the Avengers movies too, right? They're they're always toy sets with all the guys, and Black Widow's left out. Same with Ray. Uh, it's weird. I think it's the bigger companies. Uh, it's Disney. It's the way Disney thinks, right? They don't. They have a very different way of thinking of how you make toys for little boys versus little girls, and I. think... I think maybe they're finally realizing, hey, uh, everybody can love these characters and maybe girls want, you know, action figures to play with as well. Yeah. And finally, you had to feel good. I saw this on Twitter that Tom Tenery, who's the concept artist for The Force Awakens, mm -hmm. he joined Twitter last December, I believe, ended up telling you on Twitter that your show Filmcast <laughs> inspired some of the design for the latest Star Wars film. <laughs> I, I, would, I wouldn't say we inspired the design, but he he said he listened to us, and that was really cool. That's just okay. It's, All right, right. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I miss that. Sorry. I love the movie. I just kind of want to. Uh, it's a good feeling to know, like, okay, this designer was listening to us while uh, while designing this beautiful movie. I'm going to go ahead and say that you inspired it because that's how I misread <laughs> it. Uh, but still, I like to believe that. So there we go. It's very cool. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. All right, well, this next segment is one that we're calling Virtual Reality Does What? I just made that up. Uh, it's about a week ago, a viewer named Jack Pines on Twitter watched us talking about the myriad uses of VR. He told us to get in touch with Kara Platoni to talk about her experience using cow VR. So, of course, we did welcome science reporter and author of the book, We Have the Technology, How Biohackers, Foodies, Physicians, and Scientists Are Transforming Human Perception One Sense at a Time. Wow. Kara Platoni... Welcome. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. I like how you say cow VR, like it's the cows who are wearing the helmet. <laughs> I, I feel like it's a brand. It should be a brand name. Right, yeah. The cow We're introducing be... cow VR. So tell, tell us a little bit about it. Okay, so uh, so I wrote this book called We Have the Technology, and it's about hacking sensory perception. So it's not all about VR. It's each chapter is basically, I went somewhere in the real world where someone cool was doing an interesting experiment that had to do with sensory perception. So, for example, I met a guy, one of the first people in the world to have a retinal implant in his eye. Um, I met, I watched a surgeon do a telerobotic surgery for the chapter on touch. Um, I met the people from the Long Now Foundation who are building a clock that's supposed to last 10,000 years for the chapter on time. And for virtual reality, I became a cow. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, it was... Um, one of the things that I did was I hung out a lot with the people who are at Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. And this is a really cool VR lab. Um, basically, they've been testing for years something that they call the Proteus effect. And that means do your experiences in a virtual world, do your experiences as your avatar affect how you behave in real life. And everything that they've done shows that, yeah, it does. They've done these experiments like where they make you slightly less attractive online and then they give you these uh, fake dating profiles and they find that people who are made more attractive choose hotter looking people in this phony dating profile. And people who are made less attractive are more likely to lie about their height. And they find that, for example, if they make you taller in the virtual world, when they take you out of the virtual world, you'll be more aggressive in this like real life bargaining task. They've done all of these cool things, right? So within the last few years, they started thinking like, how can we use this to be socially constructive, to do something that would be good for people? So one of the experiences that they put me in was what it's like to not be a human, to not wear a human body. And this is totally inspired by Jaron Lanier, you know, the godfather of VR. Because one of the early questions he posed was like, imagine that you're going to be a virtual lobster and the lobster has eight arms. Well, you can control arms one and two with your real arms, but how do you learn to control the other six, right? Can you adapt to a non-human body? So the, in this experiment, they had me get down on all fours. They gave me, um, I was wearing these infrared markers on my wrists 
they had me wear kind of like one of those nylon um, pennies that little kids wear when they play soccer and they have a soccer scrimmage match. And it had more uh, LEDs along the back so they could track my movement. And when I got in the simulation, in front of me, I could see my cow doppelganger, who was really cute. And, uh, you know, if you've been in VR, sometimes they experiment a setup where you can look down and see the body of your own. But that's really hard when you're pretending to be a cow and crawling <laughs> on the ground. So, uh, so they said, OK, so they put me through all these tasks to make me basically transfer consciousness or kind of a, begin to align myself with my, my cow doppelganger. So I'd lift my hoof and she'd lift her hoof and I'd walk around and she'd walk around. And they gave me all of these tasks to do. They said, okay, you're a cow and you're suitable for beef production. So what you've got to do is go over there and you have to eat enough food to gain three pounds a day. So I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of weird, but I'll do it. And then they said, okay, you need to go over here and you need to drink a lot of water because you have to gain more weight. So I went over there in the virtual simulation and I gained more water. <laughs> All right, I drank more water. And they would do things like um, they had a lab assistant who was standing there with a, a dowel with an infrared marker on it. And in the virtual world, this was a cattle prod. So you would see the cattle prod coming at you. And in the, in the real world, I would feel the assistant jabbing me in the ribs with this doubt. Oh, wow. and that's called, yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah. It's called synchronous touch. So the idea is you see it and you feel it and it makes the world feel more real. So after a few minutes, I'm doing this stuff and all of a sudden the voice says, okay, go back to the starting point and now it's time for you to go to the slaughterhouse. And I freaked out. It was one of the most amazingly scary and weird things that I've ever uh, experienced. I... I have tapes of me being in this simulation and in it, the cow part of me is doing what they told me to do. I'm walking over to the part of the pasture where they told me to, to walk. But the real me is actually yelling at the other people in the room. I'm yelling, this is brutal. Because even in only a few minutes, I already kind of sympathize with this other being who I kind of feel is me. But I also kind of feel like a protective obligation towards like, like, heck, this cow is a vegetarian, right? <laughs> and so then all of a sudden this noise starts. It's of a truck coming at me. It has that like beep, beep noise of the truck backing up. And in this virtual lab, they can actually shake the floor. So the floor starts to shake. And that's when it got really scary because I was thinking, what's going to happen next? You know, am I actually going to see myself die? And that was the end of the experiment. So what they were actually trying to do, if I had been a real trial participant, is they would have given me all these psychological measures to measure how empathetic I felt towards animals and what I felt about animal rights and animal cruelty. And the idea was to see if I could share a consciousness or at least share empathy with another animal. And then the next phase of their experiment, they thought, okay, cows, they're cute, they're mammals, we kind of relate to cows. What if we put you in a body that's not like a cow at all? So they put me in a coral. And this was really bizarre because a coral doesn't move. It's purple. It's, <laughs> you know, it doesn't look like a person at all. And what you do is while you're inhabiting this coral body, um, the ocean around you starts to acidify. And this voice overhead is telling you about carbon emissions and how they affect the ocean and how they affect kind of the food chain in the ocean. So you start to see that there are fewer and fewer animals around you. The water gets cloudy. And then you start to see parts of your coral body wither and drop off. It's a really amazing experience. So we talk a lot about VR, uh, use of VR as a way to increase empathy. I mean, is that... Do you think that it, it does in this case? Yeah, absolutely. I was impressed by, given the fact that I'd only been in these simulations for a few minutes, I was impressed by how strongly I felt. I was really surprised when I was told that I was going to the slaughterhouse. And I was not only kind of angry, but afraid at the same time, truly nervous. I really felt present in that cow body and kind of attached to being a cow. Now, Devendra, you have you have a, a passion in VR as well as film. Uh, have you ever experienced anything like this um, in your own kind of interactions with VR, where you know it's mm -hmm. it's less about playing a game and it's more about creating an experience that I don't I don't know that that brings you closer to that kind of empathy side of things. Uh, I, I, nothing as intense as this one. Uh, <laughs> it sounds pretty intense. I, I, I think most of the VR demos I've seen have been about experiences, right? right. I did the Game of Thrones, uh, walking along the side of the wall, 
uh, you know, the wall of the North or what is the name of that? Um, but you're walking like on top of this thing and you're hundreds of feet up and you're looking over the edge and it just, you know, you have that experience of being somewhere very high up. I've tried a demo too, where you're like underwater and a whale is going by you and you can kind of reach out and almost try to feel it. Uh, I'm wondering, Kara, like, uh, is this something you think, um, I feel like one of the things uh, educators want in children, right, is to promote empathy and to make them more empathetic. You think like something like this would be a great thing to have kids kind of go through, uh, kind of all kids to kind of get this sense of empathy uh, for other creatures? Yeah, so that's actually why this lab, it's uh, led by Jeremy Balenson at Stanford. And one mm -hmm. of the reasons they're testing it is because they think it might be an educational tool. What they want to do is compare the VR experience to, well, okay, what happens if you just watch something on video? What happens if you just read something? Is being more immersed in it, is that a better teaching tool? Do you learn more? And there's another application too, um, which is uh, I went to Buckley Air Force Base in Colorado with a different VR lab, a VR lab from uh, University of Southern California. And they were using VR as a way to see if they could pre-treat soldiers who were about to deploy to Afghanistan to see if they could help prevent them from getting post-traumatic stress disorder. And the idea was to simulate some of the stressors they might face in combat before they went uh, in order to see if it would make them more resilient to developing PTSD when they came back. And they've actually done a long line of experience, uh, experiments for many years with soldiers who've already deployed, already come home with PTSD, to see if reliving traumatic situations in the company of a therapist helps them get over those symptoms and get better. So there's actually really interesting work being done to see if you can use VR as a healing tool, basically so real that it can trick the mind. Wow. So we don't want to give away all the spoilers from your book. Um, one more thing I wanted to ask you about. You, you spent some time with biohackers. Those are the people yeah. that, you know, put magnets in their fingers, that sort of thing. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So, uh, so one of the big questions is, okay, it, do we have to be stuck with only five senses? Like, what's this, this basic human apparatus? Maybe not so great. As one of the biohackers told me, nobody reasonable would engineer it. You know, they thought there's a lot of limitations to the human body. So I spent a lot of time with Grindhouse Wetware, which is a biohacker collective uh, out of Pennsylvania. And they are... Um, they're actually kind of like the grinder arm of the biohacker universe. So, you know, some biohackers, I'm sure you know people who are really into like optimizing diets uh, or supplements. Some people consider themselves biohackers because they're using like smartwatch, smart, smart wristband, that sort of thing to optimize sleep, uh, exercise. These guys are building stuff in their basement to actually put in their body. And so most of them start with implanting a magnet first, or rather having a piercer implant the magnet for them. They're not doing it themselves. And then they develop things to build on the magnet. So uh, one of the things Grindhouse has done is uh, like they, they built a kind of a sonar glove that interacts with that magnet, and you can use it to tell what, what's coming at you. When I was there, they had just put this device called Circadia in Tim Cannon's arm. And this is the device about the size of a deck of cards. And it was in Tim Cannon's arm uh, right here. And what it did was it read out his body temperature, ported that information to his cell phone through Bluetooth. And that was kind of a demo device just to see, like, could he safely wear it? Would he get an infection? Could they charge it over a long period of time? It, you know, would Tim die? Um, Tim didn't die. Uh, he was fine. He wore it for three months. And they had just started building this thing called North Star. And the idea for North Star was to be an in-hand compass. It kind of goes in the back of your hand here. It's about the size of a quarter. And uh, the idea is it would light up when you face north. So it would become uh, kind of a de facto sense of direction. And this Thanksgiving, they came out with the early version of the North Star. They actually brought it out. I think five or six guys got the implant. This one doesn't have the compass in it. It just lights up, but they built it. They did it. They implanted it. It's out there. Well, Kara, thank you so much for joining us. Kara Platoni is at karaplatoni.com. She's a teacher at Berkeley at Kara Platoni on Twitter and the author of the book, We Have the Technology. And if you are in the Bay Area, Kara has two talks coming up, January 27th at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco and March 3rd at Kepler's Books in Menlo Park. Kara, thanks so much for coming on. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Also want to thank Devendra Hardwar. Thank you for uh, hanging out for a little bit of extra time to kind of give us your thoughts no on VR and just everything in general cool that you're always doing over at Engadget. <laughs> so thank you so thank much. You. Thanks right for having on. me. Have a great night. Thanks, guys. 
Up next, what does your friends count on Facebook say about the quality of friendship? But first, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of this episode, Pill Pack. Now, is there anything in the world more optimistic than vitamins? I have a cabinet full of them, which means I am very optimistic. My problem has always been that I could never seem to find a way to remember to take them until Pill Pack. Pill Pack was founded by a second generation pharmacist inspired to use technology and design to fix the pharmacy and deliver a better customer experience. It's great for prescriptions and non-prescription vitamins too. Your Pill Pack arrives in a convenient recyclable dispenser. It has one easy to read label that includes an image of each medication and directions. I think we have the dispenser right here. It has a list of my fake medications and uh, it has easy to tear off packets. You just tear them off and everything's in there. You take your vitamins or your prescriptions and you're done. Pill Pack, you know how I feel about robots. Pill Pack also loves robots. They, robots work along with pharmacists. They, the pharmacists oversee everything. They ensure the accuracy of every Pill Pack. Now, people are still an important part of the equation. Pill Packs pharmacists are available 24-7 from the privacy of your own home. No more long lines or awkward conversations at the pharmacy. They also proactively call your doctor for you to manage all your refills so you will never run out. There's no extra cost beyond your standard copays. Shipping is always free. It's compatible with most major insurance plans, including most forms of Medicare Part D. And when you sign up for PillPack, they will make sure that your insurance is compatible before they transfer any of your medications over. Switching is really easy. Sign up on their secure site and they take care of everything for you. There's also a PillPack medication reminder for the iPhone. And I even have one for my Apple Watch, so I never have to worry about missing any of those notif notifications. PillPack is simple, convenient, and modern, and you won't believe how cool it is until you try it. Here's what you can do. Visit PillPack.com slash twit to sign up now. Their site is beautiful. It only takes about five minutes to sign up. When you use our link and transfer your prescriptions to PillPack, you will get a credit for $20 worth of vitamins and OTC. That's pillpack.com slash T-W-I-T. We want to thank TNT's fan of the day who sent not one, but two examples of how he watches this show at Tim Daly I-I-I. Says or the third, whatever, or the that, third. whatever that means. I like I-I-I. <laughs> yeah. It's fun to say. Sometimes on the little screen on the train and sometimes on the big screen at home. Very nice. So. And always Megan, it appears. <laughs> that looks like it might have been uh, last year because of the stockings, but I don't oh. know. I still have a lot of my holiday decorations. I know, up, right? So I still have my lights up. It could be yeah. April and there would still be stockings. <laughs> Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag How I Watch TNT and we will find it. And speaking of Facebook, if you haven't already joined our Facebook community, go there. Uh, to Facebook Tech News Today. We will put short clips from the show up there. So if you like them, you can share them or comment or whatever you like. We can, we'll check those comments and read some of those on the whatever show. Whatever you do over there on Facebook, yeah. maybe you'll become friends with our videos. Uh, true friends though, that's, that's the question here. It turns out the amount of online friends you have doesn't actually translate to being rich in real world friendship. Mm -hmm. University of Oxford psychologists determined in a study that users had between well, right around 155 to 183 friends between a couple of their studies on Facebook with around 28% of those considered close friends. Now of those close friends, only four or so would be trusted to turn to in times of crisis or for sympathy. So a low number of actual real close friends. That doesn't really regard. surprise me. And I've also read about, you know, cause I get this feeling when uh, someone that's not in my inner circle, but mm -hmm. I am Facebook friends with, if they're having a hard time or you know something happens to them, or I kind of am suspecting that they're having a hard time judging by their Facebook posts. And I know I can't really do anything. I get a little anxious. And I think that's scientifically proven. Like we, we as a species can only care about a certain amount of people. And then yeah, that's true. when we start to, when we can't do anything about that wider circle, it causes anxiety. So. Yeah, I know. My, my Facebook usage has been scaling back and I'm starting to have, strangely, I'm starting to have Facebook slash friendship guilt mm -hmm. because for so many of my really close friends, people that I know that I could depend on and, and all that 
that this study is about, they don't live here anymore. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by, by and large, a lot of the way that I communicate with them is on Facebook. And that, that's, that's the challenge, right? Like Facebook has so much, uh, you know, so many people using Facebook and depending on it to communicate with each other that if you actually do hit that point to where you're kind of like, eh, I think I want to take a step back from Facebook. You're not just taking a step back from Facebook. You're taking a step back from the people who you've grown accustomed to keeping in contact with mm -hmm. on Facebook. Um, I don't know. Is Facebook kind of detrimental in the long term to actual core friendships? I don't know. I mean, I talked to, uh, I interviewed on Tech News Tonight, uh, a therapist about this, and she had some tips for using Facebook uh, in ways that wouldn't make you depressed by using it. And one, <laughs> one thing she said that if you're going to use it, uh, don't just observe. Don't just go there right. and read everything. Um, leave something, you know, Post yeah, you gotta participate. There. So if you don't sure. care, if you're not interested in posting on Facebook, maybe it's not a good idea to be on there at all. And also, I mm. found it disconcerting sometimes my friends that never post and never like anything, and then you tell them a story and they say, "Yeah, I saw that on Facebook," and you think, "Oh, you're on Facebook," but you never. Then it just feels sort of like they're just standing in the room without saying anything, and that's creepy. I think a lot of people stand in that virtual room and don't say anything. Yeah, they just don't do use that. it Leave. as a feed of watching right. what what you know the people that they care yeah. about are doing. And uh, and, and also, lurking. It's, it's good to understand. You know, we all fake it a little bit on Facebook, right? Yeah. It's always the you know pretty things and the not the time when your kids are tearing each other apart and, <laughs> sure. you know, th those kinds of things. So, you know, to know, I, I mean, I try to be honest and, but you know, it, a, a lot of it is just presenting the best side. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so tomorrow on tomorrow's show, we're welcoming our guest, awesome uh, guy. We've had him on all that Android and some of our other shows plenty of times, mm -hmm. Russell Hawley of Android Central It'd be great to get him on to talk about all the tech news. Tech News Today records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 12 a.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can always be a part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv or leaving us a short voicemail. That's 260-TNT-SHOW. And finally, you can always kind of catch us on Twitter. Uh, the show is at Tech News Today TV. And if you want to know more about our upcoming guests or get behind the scenes gossip, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Sign up at twit.tv slash newsletter. And don't forget also to subscribe to the show. You can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or iTunes. Choose your favorite podcast catcher and subscribe. All the ways to subscribe are at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to get in touch with us directly, you can find us on Twitter too. I am at Megan Maroney. And I am Jason Howell. And that's all we got. Thank you so much for watching this uh, today. And we'll, we're going to see you tomorrow uh, afternoon with Russell Holly. Take care, you guys. I'm not going to look at your elbow.